It's round 15 of Villains Too Stupid to Win, and we've inevitably come to another misguided corporation, but this one hits a little different. It's International Genetic Technologies, or InGen, from the Jurassic Park franchise. 11 years after he impressively endeared a disturbing alien creature to an audience of sproglets, Spielberg is back to capitalise on the widespread juvenile fascination with dinosaurs, and in the process reach all new heights of power over our childhood nostalgia. He's exploiting your enchantment with these. It's a movie that transforms our docile, comfortably distant reptile friends into cunning, threatening predators, yet somehow still commodifying them enough to shift a whole mess of merch and create limitless licensing and spin-off opportunities. You, you patented it and packaged it and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox and now you're selling it, you're going to sell it well. And in a strange act of self-flagellation, we also get a prominent theme criticizing the commercialization of dinosaurs, directed mostly at Hammond, our unconventional main villain and a character Spielberg personally identifies with. You're dead. You crazy son of a bitch, you're dead. Even his foray into the new power of CGI is not too dissimilar to Hammond bringing dinosaurs to life. In fact, many of Hammond's decisions feel like a reflection of the creative compromises that were actually made in the source material and by Spielberg and co, choosing style over substance for the sake of brand concerns and entertainment value. Most obviously, they forever solidified scaly dinosaurs into the public psyche as if it needed more entrenchment, despite the fact that even during the 90s, the idea that many dinosaurs were feathered was gaining more evidence by the year. In universe, it's possible their genetic tampering prevented feathers, or it was an intentional choice to remove those genes. The form is not predefined. It is a reflection of the builder's state of mind. Not one person, real or imagined, wants your damned dino birds, okay? And if you could make our velociraptors bigger than turkey size, that'd be great. More like a six foot turkey. Yeah, nowadays we've discovered the comparatively large Utah Raptor, but that one doesn't have the cool name. The theme park itself is also intentionally misnamed as a matter of brand appeal, called Jurassic Park when most of the big ticket dinos are actually from the Cretaceous period, which conveniently is a strategy that also benefits the actual novel and the movie series. But the thing is, it's also clever and well intentioned, I'm not even mad about any of it, how could I be? Because Jurassic Park delivers us the miracle of not dinosaurs brought back from extinction after 65 plus million years. Admittedly, an astonishing accomplishment which despite our best hopes probably won't become reality. But if it ever does, despite the shade I'm about to throw, just know that I'm still 100% in. Just as long as we don't have the likes of InGen at the helm, they're a bioengineering firm that dabbles in construction, security, and theme parks extremely poorly, and their actual bioengineering is even more concerning. Over the course of the franchise, InGen brew up numerous flawed copies of the most dangerous predators to ever walk the earth, and their management of these creatures is just the worst, potentially endangering humanity and the entire global ecosystem. It's a cautionary tale of man attempting to to play God and the consequences of unchecked scientific power. Ideas that originally came from the novel by acclaimed author and filmmaker Michael Crichton, who seems to just love delving into near future theme parks gone awry. Welcome to Jurassic Farce. Point 1. Despite claims to the contrary, Jurassic Park spared many expenses and any semblance of competence. So Scottish venture capitalist John Hammond, a hack showman with delusions of grandeur, got to start grifting people with his phony flea circus before funding the research that led to the de-extinction of the first dinosaurs, opening Pandora's box of genetic manipulation and changing the world forever, eventually founding InGen and establishing Jurassic Park on Isla Nublar, an island west of Costa Rica. So the blame, more or less, rests squarely on Hammond's shoulders. At least in the first movie, InGen doesn't even get lip service, just a few shots of their logo. No, this is firmly the Hammond Show. Willfully ignorant of the horrific reality of his creations, no one is bought into dinosaur romanticism more than this guy. But it's hard to get truly salty with him, because despite being responsible for the coming calamity, he still comes across as an affable, reasonable guy. Wait a second. A chubby, jolly, bearded older gentleman who's been toiling away for years in his isolated hideaway, using his army of underpaid workers 
sugar elves to pump out products for children or to make a shitload of money. I mean, deliver the ultimate gift of dinosaurs. He's practically a Jurassic Santa Claus. If only Hammond had Santa's operational prowess though, we could have avoided this whole mess. Because in reality, John acts more like the Grinch than anyone else. Ironically claiming he spared no expense while corner cutting and planning failures permeate every feature of the park. You'd think biosecurity and human safety would be of paramount concern. Hammond maintains an illusion of control when things are actually on the verge of falling apart, which they do from the very first scene. Things kick off with the InGen team transferring a raptor to its feeding pen. They've got some sort of crappy containment system with a nifty green light apparently indicating the crate is locked in. Well up! Loading team, step away! Yet a mere raptor kick is enough to completely dislodge it, sending it rolling back on its railings, causing all kinds of mayhem. What exactly is that green light meant to represent? And they even skimped on an automatic door, so some poor sap has to be up there at the most dangerous point of the operation. But it's bad, no expense. This worker's preventable death triggering a $20 million lawsuit which means a slippery lawyer is on his way to rain on Hammond's parade. Not to ensure human safety of course, but to represent the financial interests of the shareholders, or so he claims. So Jurassic Santa hatches a little scheme to save Christmas, taking his sleigh to recruit renowned paleontologist Alan Grant, fresh from a hard day of eviscerating some dipshit little kid, who travelled all the way to this dig site yet seems to be a dino hater. That doesn't look very scary. You should be schooling him my man. Hammond, acting shifty from the start, fails to introduce himself before invading Alan and Ally's personal living space, lording over them in a conceited attempt to establish his authority. Stop. I can see that my uh, 50,000 a year has been well spent. Before bribing them with an irresistible offer to fund their dig site for years in exchange for their endorsement of his new park. Well, I could compensate you by fully funding your dig. And so they're whisked off to Isla Nublar along with a random chaos theorist. Not a guy you'd think would be qualified for a trip to an animal park. But hey, if this is a genuine attempt by Hammond to bring a dissenting voice to the table, then credit to him. Though perhaps an animal behaviorist or some sort of international observer would be a better pick. I'm sure they would still be hating on everything you're doing around here. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get this tour underway, huh? Oh no, it's a boring technical presentation. Fine for the scientists perhaps, but that's not going to hold the attention of children desperate to see the dinos. Must go faster. Odds are they'll know everything there is to know about the park before they even get here. When they first opened, they had eight species. Now they have 14 herbivores and six carnivores. And straight away I'm wondering why our head of InGen here has designed the intro video to require his presence at every sitting. That's probably going to end up a full time job. So they've been harvesting ancient dino DNA from mosquitoes trapped in amber, then haphazardly patching up all the genetic gaps with genes from modern animals, without any concern for the unintentional effects these genes might have. They'll be genetic chimeras more than actual dinosaurs, it's just the flea circus reborn. Except this time the fleas have teeth and claws which they can and will kill you with. And as we discover in a later movie, 100% DNA retrieval may have been possible. We've brought back numerous species in their purest form and I mean complete untouched genomes. And this was backed up by further evidence from Jurassic Park the game, so it seems they've skimped out here on the most important features of the park. Spared no expense. The man primarily responsible for these genetic breakthroughs is Dr. Henry Wu. He seems ignorant of the true implications of his creations, coming across as overconfident and defensive from the get go. We control their chromosomes. It's really not that difficult. You're implying that a group composed entirely of female animals will. He also doesn't seem very strict on lab procedures either, allowing these filthy tourists to just waltz in here unprotected. Wu believes that keeping the dinos female will be enough to stop them reproducing, when it's common knowledge that some animals, let alone reptiles with funky genetics, have some pretty out there methods of modifying their gender and impressively adaptive reproductive abilities. I would have thought the saner strategy would be to just neuter them all and then you can have males too and study their associated behaviours. 
is. For all he knows, the lack of males will make these females start reproducing via parthenogenesis, the act of cloning themselves by way of an unfertilized egg. And now you've got unaccounted dinos who can probably get through the fences. And of course, the obvious criticism, they should have just stuck with herbivores. But naturally, safety takes a back seat because absolutely everyone, including me, wants to see the T-Rex and those badass raptors. But the most horrific act of abuse going on around here is perpetuated by Hammond himself. In a sheer act of arrogance, he makes sure to be present for every hatching, forcing each dino newborn to imprint on him personally, before presumably disappearing for years until they randomly see their MIA adopted parent go past their enclosure all giddy. It's safe to say Hammond, despite his apparent niceness, is still in possession of an unconventional yet raging god complex. In the meantime, the carnivores are kept parent and peerless in the lab until they're a young adult, then released into a pen alone or sometimes with others of their ilk when appropriate. These abused adolescent dinos lacking in socialization aren't just unpredictable due to their genetics or the fact that they're natural predators. They've been raised with a high probability of becoming psychopaths as well. Animals raised in isolation aren't always the most functional. These revelations alone are enough for Smooth Talking Chaos Guy to roast Hammond good and proper with a series of sick philosophical burns. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. Apparently, even chaos theorists prefer predictability and order. Chaotician, chaotician, actually. Alan and Ali haven't even had the full tour yet, but are already against the park as well. Hammond wasting an expense here on a chess squad of scientists who apparently can't be bought. It might be news to him, but scientists are often driven by motivations other than money. He seems to have incorrectly assumed they'd be as morally dubious as he is. And if you can't convince Alan, you won't be able to convince anyone except venture capitalists. Because this guy has a passion for dinosaurs that borders on the erotic. Are these characters... Uh... Auto erotica? Leaving the idiot lawyer to be the only one instantly wooed by the reptiles, seemingly believing he's going to receive a personal windfall from Jurassic Park. We're gonna make a fortune with this place. Presumably, he's referring to the endless lawsuits this place will generate for him. That's not exactly a legitimate endorsement. He's pretty much betting against the house. Shit gets even bleaker in the control room when we meet the most comically dumb of all InGen employees, Dennis Nedry. <laughs> Nedry rolled out their park management system, which is currently suffering a grand total of 151 errors. Item 151 on today's glitch list. And to make things worse, this guy doesn't seem capable or willing to fix anything. Being unreliable as hell and possessing a serious attitude problem. Yeah, he's basically Newman. Hello, Newman. Nedry's demeanor is partially driven by an apparent pay dispute with Hammond, who seems to have hired him on the singular basis that he offered to do the work for the lowest possible price. You know anybody who can network eight connection machines and debug two million lines of code for what I bid for this job? Hammond rejecting the more expensive offers from people we can safely assume were far more talented. And this is one area of the park you just can't afford to go cheap on. It's bad, no expense. There should probably be an entire department maintaining this computer system, not a single employee with sole access. What's the plan when Nedry takes a day off? Hammond is massively over-reliant on a guy who turns out to be a selfish, reckless moron. If Nedry offered or accepted the lowball offer, then he should obviously just suck it up and do the work. But it is possible there is some other method by which Hammond ripped him off. Nedry's gripe is pretty much legitimate in the book. Movie Hammond being an established cheapskate, I wouldn't put it past him. But whatever the case, this guy's an obvious liability and should never have been allowed to set foot in this place. He's been doing a half assed job out of spite and now he's even guilty of corporate espionage, intending to deliver a batch of embryos to a rival company. But he doesn't seem to fathom that if this place isn't running properly, it's going to put everyone in danger, including himself. Especially since he intends to sabotage the system and drop the embryos off at the dock with a cyclone on its way. That's right, Hammond also hasn't accounted for the fact that Isla Nublar is in an area prone to tropical cyclones. And as you can probably guess, the park isn't prepared for this event in any way, shape, or form. Mechanical glitches would seem to be the least of our problems. Most of the staff are evacuating, but it doesn't appear to be a safety measure due to the cyclone because they've been calling them to the docks before they even knew it was going to hit them. All personnel be at the dock no later than 
Bad. It seems everyone is just off for their weekend, leaving a skeleton crew behind to manage the park. What a great time to get a tour underway. Throw the grandkids in there too, why not? I expect each of you to sit quietly and not touch any of the equipment. So we're off, and a bunch of modified Ford Explorers that Hammond suggests are electric cars, when in reality they're closer to electric trams, ceasing to function the second the juice stops coming through the track. Spared no expense. That could be kind of dangerous should there be a problem with the power supply. But oh look, CD-ROMs. He hasn't even put child locks on the doors, allowing anyone to just leave the tour vehicle at any time and stumble into an electric fence, or worse. I told you how many times we needed locking mechanisms on the vehicle Stop doors. Right. I'm beginning to think this whole thing may just be an elaborate suicide machine. And just like many a zoo experience, you'll be lucky to see anything at all. The very first stop on the tour and there was little chance of seeing any dinos thanks to the vegetation blocking the view. But hey, we can't expect much from a guy who intends to open the park without all the attractions finished. The park will open with the basic tour you're about to take and then other rides will come online 6 or 12 months after that. First impressions don't matter at all according to Hammond because dinosaurs. Now we're off to the T-Rex enclosure, surely there'll be some sweet action over there. We'll get that thing to put on a show even if we have to traumatize some children to make it happen. Hammond acknowledging that the park is primarily targeting children. Spend a little time with our target audience. Grandpa! Yet not for a second thinking that a monster slaughtering a live goat may not be an appropriate form of entertainment. And that probably stands for many adults as well. And no concern at all for his particularly sensitive vegetarian granddaughter. Maybe he's doing some psychological testing on his own grandkids, I wouldn't put it past him. The only thing standing between the patrons and these dangerous dinos are these 10,000 volt electric fences. It's some kind of barrier I guess. I'll be honest though, the trees dangling everywhere with a good chance of cyclones doesn't exactly fill me with confidence even assuming the power stays on. Fairly alarmed here. These fences could be compromised by falling trees or branches, either damaging them or reducing the voltage due to contact. All of which makes them not really suitable for securing these lethal reptiles. You must be asking yourself, what if this doesn't work? And once the power goes down during the inevitable natural disaster or a man-made one, there's nothing stopping these guys from tearing this piddly fence and you apart. Hammond skimping out, making the predator areas a safari tour, when what was obviously needed was a series of reinforced concrete enclosures, raised viewing platforms and a protected pathway to guide the visitors through. I like to think of it as a living system. Mimon Nedri has been waiting until the very last second to get the embryos and make it to the docks. And to get there, he'll need to mess up the system royally by initiating a program that will cause many of the park systems to go down, including most of the fences, endangering everyone and himself most of all. Hammond doesn't even question Nedri about running the supposed maintenance program in the middle of a tour, when he should have got him to do it overnight or literally any other time when there isn't people out there. This massive system outage was just to cover Nedry's activities and allow him to get through a few electrified gateways. And boom, here's that cyclone. I'm beginning to think Nedry actually wants to die. Even if he survived, it's not like he's going to get away with any of this. Getting lost and driving like a maniac in unsafe conditions. Crashing his Jeep Wrangler and thinking he needs the winch. When this model should have a four-wheel drive mode, which he obviously should have used from the start. Not to mention, it could probably get him out of this current mess. And so dumbass Nedry quickly discovers, just like anyone who has ever visited a low rent petting zoo, you'll see next to nothing for the longest time and then suddenly you've got something spitting in your face. Nedry suffering a truly well earned death after doing the Dilophosaurus equivalent of throwing up a challenge when he raises his hood, leaving everyone else in Jurassic Park in a complete shitstorm of Nedry and Hammond's making. With communications, most of the fences and the supposed EVs all down and not a satellite phone to be seen. We spared no expense. The first guest tour is left to have a stoush with a T-Rex and there's no way some basic plexiglass will be enough to stop her. And as expected, all of the psycho carnivorous dinos are acting with extreme hostility towards humans. Not helped along by the fact they've been confined to these shitty little enclosures and deprived of the hunt for so long. T-Rex doesn't want to be fat, he wants to hunt. 
This whole car conveyor belt thing probably looks like a sushi train restaurant to these beasts. Meanwhile, Jurassic Santa is stress eating, still more concerned with the future of the park over the safety of his own grandkids. Who better to get the children through Jurassic Park than a dinosaur expert? over dependent on automation i can see that now now the next time everything's correctable they're left with no way to override nedry's program they can't get past his password and they don't even have a guess so with the park systems in disarray they're left with little choice but to switch the whole thing off and on again without considering that would also shut down the last and perhaps most important fence of all the raptor pen and the worst part is both the safety bunker they're heading to and the circuit breakers in need of a flicking are near the raptors this supposed safety bunker is more a raptor larder at this stage. I'd rather be searching the coast for a rowboat. There must be something around here. A seaworthy log would do. Logic dictates a single course of action. Retreat. And so, with Ray failing to return from the circuit breaker excursion, it's up to Ellie to get the job done. Escorted by our supposed game warden and raptor expert, Robert Muldoon. Admittedly, he's a bit saner than the typical worker around here. Recognizing the shortcomings of the park and believing all the raptors should be euthanized. They should all be destroyed. But he's still an in-gen employee, so of course he's gonna be guilty of a few errors. Earlier, he was pretty slow off the mark, leaving it to Ellie to do the tracking. And now, readying the expedition through raptor country he seems to load very few shells into his spaz 12 shotgun when it should hold a total of nine not that he'll get to fire a single one of them focusing in on one vacant looking raptor standing around like an obvious decoy letting himself get ambushed by animals he should be well aware of pack hunters also the exact raptor hunting method described by a paleontologist who had never seen a raptor until yesterday and that's when the attack comes not from the front but from the side. When Muldoon should have had way more observational experience to work with. And you are a great white hunter? Ellie does the business, but barely escapes with her life. And concerningly, despite there being abundant prey around, the raptors seem to track most of the remaining humans to the visitor center. It's almost as if they're out for revenge. While all of the dinos are somewhat dangerous and have the potential to cause massive disruption to the global ecosystem, it's these fictional raptors with their intelligence, cooperation, language, and their ability to manipulate the environment that really ups the threat level. They were smarter than dolphins or whales. They were smarter than primates. If any creature is capable of supplanting us, it's probably these guys. Alan. Uh. Alan. Though I will admit, it's pretty unlikely that any animal other than ourselves is capable of doing us in. InGen standing as testament to this. Predictably, the dinos have already found a way to reproduce and they've apparently been doing so long before Alan and co got here. And worst of all, they seem to be raptor eggs. There being some suggestion that the raptors had a larger enclosure that was never referenced. It was the damn frog DNA that did it, giving them the ability to switch sexes. These creatures now legitimately have the chance to make a mess of the world. But don't worry, Hammond and co have designed the dinos to be incapable of producing lysine, relying on humans to get their hit. The animals can't manufacture the amino acid lysine. Unless they're completely supplied with lysine by us, they slip into a coma and die. Which doesn't make a lick of sense because every animal is dependent on getting lysine from their diets, none of us produce it. This supposed lysine contingency will achieve absolutely nothing. To overcome it, the animals just need to keep eating, they won't need to adapt at all. Life, uh... Aside from the inherent lysine, even the lush background of Jurassic Park is ominously threatening. This place is filled with prehistoric plants that pose yet another serious risk to the outside ecosystem. How can you know anything about an extinct ecosystem? And therefore, how could you ever assume that you can control it? And you just know the biosecurity at the border is going to be non-existent. Not to mention, it's pretty hard to stop some seeds from traveling on the wind or in a bird's gut. Why Hammond even bothered with the plants, I couldn't say. No one gives a damn about prehistoric flora when there's dinosaurs around. In terms of potential threat, the only in-gen creation I'm unsure about is Rexy. She kills the blood-sucking lawyer, waited until the cover of darkness to eat the goat in front of the kids, showed 
consumed with their lack of proper supervision and then at the end comes out of nowhere to save them from the raptors. She just might be the real hero. Considering her poor movement based eyesight, which Alan somehow magically knows all about despite there being no basis for it in reality, she might also be a victim of InGen's shoddy genetic manipulation as it was in the book. So it's not surprising there is one deserving morsel she missed. Hammond somehow avoiding the consequences of his actions, being the only survivor who never once had his life directly threatened by a dinosaur. Remind me to thank John for a lovely weekend. The skeleton and Gen crew well on their way to becoming actual skeletons, or more accurately, Dino Poo. Hammond leaving it to the untrained outsiders to ultimately save the day, remaining deluded about the future of the park right up until the last second when he changes his tune just a bit. I've decided not to endorse your park. So have I. El Protags finally getting off the island and with the sight of some vaguely stalk-like pelicans, I guess we get the resolution for this awkward breeding theme. Hold on to your butts. But the trouble doesn't appear to be over because they're flying towards the setting sun into the middle of the Pacific. But somehow they all survived. We'll assume the pilot realized he was going the wrong way the second the credits rolled. And so, with Jurassic Park in ruins, the dinos are left to inherit Isla Nublar. If only Hammond had actually spared no expense, it is possible this place could have been a success, at least for a time. Though Hammond may be over dinosaurs, there's still a company with shareholders to worry about. And so, the long sad story of InGen is not over, in fact it's only just begun. Point 2. InGen's second incarnation is somehow worse than the first. So after the fiasco that was Jurassic Park, Hammond has surprisingly stuck to his guns, now intending to achieve protected status for the remaining dinos and out of the hands of InGen forever. But then weirdly, his company has also been covering up everything that happened at Jurassic Park. It's not clear if that was Hammond's doing, but it's safe to say the profit-hungry board aren't taking well to his newfound conservationism. So Hammond is ousted and replaced by his annoyingly pompous nephew, Peter Ludlow, who seems to share his uncle's arrogance but not one shred of his charisma. This suit costs more than your education. Ludlow is way closer to the dastardly corporate douchebag we're accustomed to. He's totally unlikable. It just comes off like a hustle. I mean, it's not your fault. They say talent skips a generation, so... Uh... This is where InGen shifts from being simply misguided to outright nefarious. An extinct animal that's brought back to life has no rights. It exists because we made it. We patented it. We own it. Ludlow does manage to avoid most of the failings from the first movie, but only because he never even gets to run a park. Instead, he'll be messing up in completely new territory and in some ways that are even worse than Hammond. But unsurprisingly, Hammond's run of errors isn't quite over yet. As we discover, there was actually a second dino island, Isla Sauna, where InGen had been brewing up most of their monsters. When the cyclone hit, it hit them hard, and of course they weren't prepared for it in any way. So they abandoned an array of values valuable facilities and technology and set all the dinos free just prior to evacuating. And of course this includes a bunch of new carnivores, including these flying extra psycho pterodons. Yeah just let those loose I guess. There's also at least one off the book super predator that just might be the first time InGen experimented with hybridization. I remember that on InGen's list. It's because it wasn't on their list and that makes you wonder what else they were up to. While releasing these dinosaurs may seem like an act of benevolence, biosecurity wise you should probably be putting them all down. And let's be honest, the only reason they didn't do that was to try and recoup some assets later. As expected, all the dinos easily got past the half-assed anti-breeding regime and that lysing contingency just wasn't any kind of thing. That is one big pile of shit. Which is probably for the best in terms of profits because otherwise there wouldn't be any dinos left and InGen isn't done on Isla Sauna yet. But they've neglected this lost world for four whole years, leaving all their facilities to rot. They probably should have gone back ASAP or a skeleton crew, a living one, should never have left. Not that they'd care, but with no one at all monitoring the island, it's endangering local fishermen. See, 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 he's heard stories of fishermen that came too close to the island and then never returned. Naturally, it's not until a rich tourist has a boo-boo that the company is finally forced to act. Or at least, use that as an excuse to pin it all on Hammond and boot him. You would have thought the company, being on the verge of bankruptcy, would have been enough. 
So Ludlow is off to Isla Sauna to mitigate the company's losses with some more idiocy of his own. In Hammond's engine, we saw them brought down by being ill-equipped and incompetent. In Ludlow's case, they seem to have actually spared no expense, so if anything goes wrong, it's all on them. This band of mercs tasked with wrangling a bunch of dinos and bringing them to San Diego for a new Jurassic Park Zoo. It's like Ludlow just wants to have an incident. When it could be completed and ready to receive visitors in less than a month. He rubbishes the idea of having an isolated island park, which is pretty much the only thing Hammond did right. Though I have to give Ludlow credit for confining the operation to scooping up herbivores, at least initially. Despite this being way out of his area of expertise, Ludlow thought it would be a good idea to tag along when there's not really any good reason for him to be here. This is a game trail, Mr. Ludlow. Carnivores hunt on game trails. Do you want to set up base camp or a buffet? Narrowly avoiding setting up base camp on a game trail, he completely capitulates to Roland anyway. A renowned hunter who seems pretty pissed off to be given the opportunity of a lifetime. Well, I've been on too many safaris with rich dentists to listen to any more suicidal ideas. Okay. Also, probably the worst leader this expedition could have hoped for, next to his second-in-command Dida and Ludlow. Though they initially have some success bagging many specimens on their wish list, it's not long before their overconfidence gets the better of them. These guys may come off as competent, but they're plagued by complacency and extremely poor decision-making. Roland especially is blinded by an obsession with establishing his superiority. All I want in exchange for my services is the right to hunt one of the Tyrannosaurs. He doesn't want money for this trip just to bag a male T-Rex and mount its head on his wall. Which for Ludlow should be a deal killer, since such a dangerous side mission could put the entire operation at risk. Which it inevitably does. So Roland is off for the hunt at the first available opportunity, leaving this dumb hothead Dieter in charge of a camp that was already heavily exposed. They've got prey animals making all kinds of distress noise, yet they don't even have guards keeping watch over their most important assets. At the very least they should be concerned about predators. What a great time for Roland to set up a T-Rex trap nearby. It's a great idea and while you're at it why don't you smear yourself with a little sheep's blood. Kidnapping an infant T-Rex and then in a deleted scene allowing a drunken Ludlow to break its leg. The T-Rex parents would have already been coming and now they're going to be extra pissed off. Hammond has also sent his own squad to Isla Sauna. Subversives who immediately take advantage of the camp's poor security, sabotaging Ingen's vehicles and releasing all the dinos. Ludlow has sobered up enough to have a premature remote board meeting that has promptly crashed. Is this really the right time and place for that? You must be patient and allow yourself sufficient time. An event that wrecks any chance InGen had of getting themselves all the assets they need, leaving their situation utterly dire. As usual, they don't have any functional communications. The comm vehicle is wrecked and every single InGen sat phone got stomped, apparently. I'm assuming they wouldn't have neglected to bring along a few of those. And in this moment of vulnerability, the only reason the men aren't finished off by a couple of angry T-Rexes is thanks to Vince Vaughn making off with the injured T-Rex Rex baby, keeping the heat off them. All things considered, he's actually helped these guys more than anything. With the T-Rexes now on the warpath, our protags and antags team up as a matter of survival. On their way to use the comms at a decrepit in-gen operations facility that just so happens to be near the raptor's nest. Meanwhile, Ludlow continues to drown his sorrows in liquor, like Roland failing to offer any semblance of leadership. Right, this is all very thrilling, but I say we should push on to the village. It's practically Vince's crew now. Dieter isn't even trying either, the supposedly experienced Merc getting lost in the woods while taking a leak. Before falling off a hill, losing his firearm, and then so bereft of fighting skill, he can't even contend with a pack of chicken-sized compy dinos. That's probably a net gain for the group. And now they're setting up camp in a spot that looks even more exposed than last night. And despite no longer having tents and vehicles to camp in, they again all go to sleep without any watchman to speak of. Except Roland and RJ, who were awake, but were off doing... something. Perhaps Roland being so callous as to use his own men as T-Rex bait. So go ahead, set up base camp right here, or in a swamp, or in the middle of a wreck's nest for all I care. So they're ambushed in the middle of the night, and Roland, unable to pop off thanks to being sabotaged by Vince once again, allows his men to panic and run off into the forest, failing to issue a single command. And you are... 
great white hunter. So he's off to resume the hunt with a trank gun, except this isn't the T-Rex that is currently hunting his men, leaving the other to slaughter at will and scatter the rest into the raptor killing fields. Along the way, the dark side paleontologist panics over a harmless milk snake running straight into the jaws of a T-Rex. That would have to be another gain. Roland has given up completely at this point, but hey, at least he got his big prize. That's all that matters, I guess. A shallow victory considering he was forced to trank it. Not really a win at all, really. Leaving the most important business, calling for help, to be taken up by our good guys once again. I suppose they should all count themselves lucky. They never had to tango with the Spinosaurus or the other beasties that are also loose around here. So lacking in dino assets, a hungover but somehow intact Ludlow tries to salvage the situation by taking this captive T-Rex and the baby he drunkenly assaulted. Roland finally comes around and realizes messing with these dinosaurs just ain't a good idea. I believe I've spent enough time in the company of death. Packing a sad over the death of his BFF, RJ, which he basically caused. Are you gonna be okay? So as usual, he deals with his issues by abandoning everyone and disappearing. Already achieving a death toll far in excess of the original Jurassic Park incident, Ludlow comes up with the bright idea of taking this extra savage, relentless T-Rex back to San Diego. It's a bad idea! So surely the ship transporting this beast must be locked down in every way imaginable. Well, all we know is that no one made it to the mainland alive and it doesn't seem to be the T-Rex is doing. It looks like the raptors got to the crew as they were launching, gobbled them and jumped off and swam back to Isla Sauna. And of course Ludlow, who you'd think would have modified his beliefs at this point considering he barely escaped with his life, calls a hastily prepared press conference full of journos and investors which promptly gets crashed again. This time in spectacular fashion along with I'm sure the in-gen stock price. Their incompetence now broadcast in real time to the world, causing the most painfully public and monumental cock-up in all of InGen's history. I'm not sure what the constant rush is with this guy. Now you're John Hammond. The best case scenario was the ship turning up here with a dead T-Rex in the hold. It stopped breathing, so we gave it an ultrazone to counteract the effects, but we didn't have much to give it. So it's time for a furious, tweaking T-Rex rampage. And yes, the most nightmarish scenario has occurred because this boy is now terrorizing American suburbia. Ludlow freezes up, worrying about the stock price more than the safety of the public. Only acting once it's far too late, when surely it should have been as simple as grabbing the damn trank rifle and sticking it again. The adult, shoot the adult, I want the baby back alive. So the good guys take advantage of the poor security that apparently also exists at InGen's mainland facilities, easily nicking one of the company's most valuable assets like it was an Amazon package, using the infant to lure the angry daddy back to the boat. All of a sudden, Ludlow is Mr. Man of Action at the worst possible moment, sneaking in to grab the baby, the parent T-Rex messing up his leg in an apparent act of revenge, and recognizing him for the weak prey that he is, demotes Ludlow to bait animal, allowing Junior to finish him. There is so much to learn for each of us today, isn't there? A series of unfortunate but avoidable events that keeps InGen on the verge of bankruptcy and completely ruins their reputation, giving Hammond all the support he needs to get Isla Sauna declared a restricted area far from the reach of the company. InGen's idiocy only diminished by the circus of a team that went back to Isla Sauna in Jurassic Park 3. But don't worry, for the world is apparently filled with gullible investors and an endless supply of dino nostalgia, and so InGen will find some new backers soon enough. Point 3. Even demoted to subsidiary, InGen is the primary source of all stupidity. So with InGen in financial ruin following the events of Jurassic Park 1 and 2, the company was snapped up for bargain bin prices by a successful and seemingly competent corporation, Masrani Global, dividing InGen into subsidiary divisions of bioengineering and security. Masrani resolves to remake Jurassic Park in their image. It's Jurassic World. A perfect name considering these dinos will inevitably contaminate our planet. Jurassic World? Not a fan. But shock horror, at least for a time, they actually pull it off. Establishing and running a profitable park on Isla Nublar for over a decade. Which makes Ludlow's belief that a faraway dino park could never work another one of his miscalculations. On the surface, a safe and well-managed park, it does seem like this time they truly spared no expense. Which unfortunately means that everything that happens from here on out is a case of pure Masrani and InGen mismanagement ruining everything. They've paved over the mistake 
mistakes of the past, setting the stage for a series of new but equally idiotic eras. The temporary success of Jurassic World lulling them into a false sense of security. And just for convenience, some of the issues I'm looking at will be Masrani's doing. But don't you worry, InGen is still at the forefront of all the stupidity around here. First of all, I'm surprised this place has managed to stay open with no acknowledged fatalities. Because plenty of these park attractions still seem pretty damn dangerous, most notably the Mosasaurus exhibit. There's little stopping this gigantic creature from flopping out into the crowd or the esplanade at any time. And it's not like a weak electric fence will be able to stop it. Considering it would have suffered the usual psychological neglect, I'm surprised it hasn't happened already. Confined to a comparatively small tank without any mates, you just know this guy is dysfunctional. It might be happy to kill itself as long as it can take some humans with it. Not to mention the danger of creating an aquatic creature and then confining it, if you can call it that, to an enclosure which is connected to the ocean. It's almost as unwise as creating flying dinos. And of course, they've got those two in massive numbers. Other initial red flags, this park also employs so-called invisible fences, which seems to be a shock mechanism built into all dino implants. But the trouble is, these things are functionally invisible too. The fairly dangerous herbivore Pachycephalosaurus, able to short out their implants during headbutting matches, allowing them to escape their enclosures, putting any bald men in the area in mortal danger. They're also allowing guests to drive themselves around in these gyrospheres, which could get them in all kinds of trouble. In emergencies, the public is still free to drive them wherever they want. Yeah, it has a few protective safety features, such as not allowing guests to drive too close to the dinos, or so they claim. But don't worry, the transparent aluminium comprising its shell can supposedly withstand a 50 caliber bullet, which may hold up in the real world, but in universe, it's probably the most unbelievable thing around here. Next to these Jurassic era jeeps still being serviceable and a Gen Zer being capable of driving manual. Ballistic resistance or not, it's just a shame these gyrospheres can't stand up to the strongest dinosaurs around. It's not actually bullets it'll have to contend with. Violence and technology? Not good bedfellows. Also, some concerning information from the extended universe, the Brachiosauruses enjoy using these things as toys. They've also got people roaming or kayaking around freely near the giant herbivores, as if accidents and territorial females are things that could never happen. They're still feeding goats to T-Rexes, and hey, I guess I was wrong because these little sickos seem to love it. When it comes to carnivores, they've got a pretty threatening array, but I'll give them credit for at least improving their enclosures, making the efforts that Hammond should have done originally, raised viewing platforms and reinforced concrete walls. Though I would suggest they raise them a bit higher than convenient eating height, but despite their token improvements, there are still some serious problems around here. Most obviously, the distant and distracted leadership. Our park operations manager, Claire Deering, is pure business. Wrapped up in her day-to-day grind, taking an impersonal approach to the living being she's ultimately responsible for. Can we just focus on the asset, please? The asset? And then there's Simon Masrani at the polar opposite of the spectrum. Not so much a tech guru, more an aspiring actual guru. The key to a happy life is to accept you are never actually in control. Ignoring the mundane realities of managing the park, he focuses almost exclusively on philosophical ramblings. Lower than our initial no, 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 no. How is it doing? Are the guests having fun? Are the animals enjoying life? But that's only when he's not endangering people with his unlicensed helicopter piloting. Yes, he's very stoned. So why don't we show a little sympathy? It's so obvious he inherited this company, he's treating it as his own personal sandbox. Or is it soapbox? He also spends a lot of time managing the other divisions of Masrani, and so has barely been around for their latest important project. He's so diversified, he doesn't even know what he owns. Both him and Claire are comfortably distant from the realities on the ground, ignorant of the very real danger of their creations and some enemies even closer to home. Neither has been closely monitoring the activities of the engine employees, and this is definitely a case of the tail wagging the vacant dino. 
Firstly, InGen Security Division are masquerading as an integral part of the global peacekeeping infrastructure when in reality they're trying to develop cutting edge weaponry, running a Raptor training program under the guise of investigating their intelligence, when this Vic guy has actually been testing their abilities with his eyes on military applications. The single most stupid idea I think we've seen in any Jurassic movie. I mean, they're probably too intelligent and vicious to tame. Even Owen, the guy who raised them since they were hatchlings, can only maintain a bare minimum of control. And even if they did have some sort of offensive capability, it's nothing a bit of human technology couldn't fix. Simple armoured vehicles could protect you from these beasts. But it's not like Vic could fathom any of this because like Masrani, he's barely here and knows very little about his own Raptor program. Another thing I'm sure he doesn't realise is the weird secret reason for his work. This ageing, overweight former soldier losing his edge more by the day, obsessing over creating the perfect bio logical weapon. This all seems to be some weird manifestation of his own inadequacies. I think I'll have that on the tour. Vic has a secret arrangement with Dr. Wu of InGen Technologies, who since the events of Jurassic Park has devolved into an unapologetic villain. Just kill people, Henry. That's unfortunate. More reckless than ever and spewing relentless arrogance. Programmable life is not the way of the future. It's what we do here every day. Compare the ancient abacus to today's supercomputers. That's how far InGen has progressed in the field of genetics. So predictably Wu is one to enforce his honorifics. Doing what, Doc? This? It's quite annoying. And it's Doctor. The heir apparent of Hammond's God Complex. Wu is thirsty for recognition and he's willing to endanger everyone to feed his insatiable ego. If I don't innovate, somebody else will. All of this exists because of me. In pursuit of this, he's now gone far beyond merely bringing back flawed dinosaurs from extinction. He's creating hybrids by haphazardly throwing together a series of concerning traits. Some designed to woo the crowd. Some intended to be used for potential military applications. All packed into a dinosaur that will be subjected to the viewing public on a regular basis. What could go wrong? First Wu tried and failed with the Scorpius Rex as seen in Camp Cretaceous, a creature whose genetic cocktail turned it into a hideous abomination that was never going to satisfy the crowd. The vicious monsters at least need to be tidy looking. <laughs> More mentally unstable than usual, with poisonous quills thanks to the lionfish, opposable thumbs giving it monkey feet, and like all these later gen dinosaurs, accelerated growth. Declaring the Scorpius a failure, Wu doesn't put it down of course, but cryogenically freezes it where I'm sure it will stay forever, until it gets defrosted and plops out a clone egg immediately. It seems like he isn't even bothering to try and prevent his creations from breeding now. I must remind you that it is also a potential security risk. Wu supposedly refines his hybridization methods and creates a bigger, better, and far more dangerous hybrid. A creature whose potential military applications do come to fruition, while also being pretty enough to turn on the viewing public. Oh yeah, ooh, ah. It's the Indominus Rex and the downfall of Jurassic World itself. A massive hybrid super predator equipped with quasi superpowers. An animal so impossibly adaptive and dangerous it could never exist in nature. We better hope this one doesn't figure out how to start making copies of itself. With a base T-Rex genome giving it strength. Giganotosaurus allowing its huge size. Carnotaurus giving it a thick protective skin. Possibly snake DNA allowing it to track heat signatures, a tree frog infusion allowing her to adapt to different climates and hide her heat signature, cuttlefish DNA for accelerated growth and camouflage, Dinosuchus for enormous teeth, Therizinosaurus giving her arms that aren't completely useless, several other dinos whose inclusion isn't completely understood, and perhaps most dangerous of all, Raptor DNA to boost her intelligence. And as a secret, extra ethically dubious addition, it's even possible there is a spot of human DNA thrown in there as well. That would explain its opposable thumbs, problem solving abilities, and perhaps its general ruthlessness. There's also some evidence the Indominus has manifested the ability to interfere with radio communication. We need to evacuate the container. <laughs> this thing isn't an exhibit, it's death incarnate. <laughs> Along with powers bordering on the supernatural, it also seems more psychotic than usual, killing its sibling early on and then raised in isolation which I'm sure only compounded its psychological problems. That's right, this thing is the homelander of dinosaurs.
the most dangerous single animal InGen has ever created and probably the most lethal land animal to ever exist on earth. They've given it the perfect name too because this thing will be close to indomitable. You are simply bad product. In time, Vic intends to shrink down the Irex into a more manageable military unit. But should something go wrong with this current beast, both him and Wu will also be in danger. Especially since they're withholding vital information from other staff who definitely need to know about these dangerous traits. They won't be able to take advantage of any potential military applications if neither of them survive. A reckless, pointless venture, considering their ability to personally profit from it would be limited at best. Vic and Wu slip this abomination past Masrani under the guise of adding a new park attraction to address their falling profits. The fickle public are just so damn tired of these boring dinosaurs. They're dinosaurs, wow enough. Simon is clueless about the Irex's genetics and he couldn't find out even if he wanted to. Apparently it's just fine for InGen to classify their work and hide it from the wider company. You know that I'm not at liberty to reveal the asset's genetic makeup. So no one except Wu is aware of these potential Indominus abilities, though even he isn't sure exactly what traits will manifest. It hid from thermal technology. Really? Jurassic World employees will just have to deal with them as they arise, making it even more unlikely they'll be able to maintain control. They're gonna learn all kinds of things about their new asset now. It all starts of course at the Irex enclosure where they're raising the walls due to her unanticipated size. I guess that's a good move. Oh and the raptor wrangler is invited over for an inspection, noticing some claw marks after they fail to pick up the Indominus on thermal imaging. Confronted with this situation, the logical assumption would be that the thermal images are playing up, but instead they assume she escaped and heads straight into the enclosure without even bothering to check its location via the tracker implanted within her, because staring more closely at those claw marks will naturally tell you something you didn't already know. Oh how, surprise surprise, the Irex can mask her heat signature, she was here all along. I'm not sure if this whole scenario proves the Indominus is smart or that the humans around here are profoundly dumb. Gluttonous security guy seals the park's fate when he panics and opens the big door, allowing the Indominus to escape. And unfortunately the Masrani response to this emergency is even worse than Hammond's. This is control put out a park wide well, alert. Hand them the damn phone please. In denial of the situation and worried about the PR fallout, they fail to call an immediate evacuation, serving up a potential smorgasbord of over 21,000 people. Evacuate the island. We'd never reopen. But have no fear, the asset containment unit is on their way and they're a department of InGen security. Make your peace now I guess. Sent out to subdue one of the most dangerous creatures in existence with taser rifles, cattle prods and a net gun. Sensor will show no weapon signature at all. At this stage I'll be searching for a trank gun so I could stick myself and make my demise slightly less excruciating. Though even conventional firearms struggle to pierce her skin, as do tranquilizer darts. They did have some marginally better firepower on hand, but they weren't authorized to use any of that because the money invested in the Irex is apparently more valuable than human lives. We have $26 million invested in that asset. We can't just kill it. It's not like she'll be easy to kill. They should have led with the biggest stuff they had. I'll tell you what you need, uh, a good antipsychotic. Obviously, they also weren't prepared for this camo ability falling straight into her trap. She's even ripped her tracker out, so good luck finding her now. Follow the screams. And so, with fatalities already mounting and with her own nephews on the line, Claire decides on a half-assed course of action, closing down the attractions in the northern area of the park under the guise of technical issues, still operating under the delusion that they actually have a force adequate enough to stop this creature. With nowhere to go and no emergency declared, everyone is just forced to cram together in the resort area, outside and heavily exposed. Their reluctance to kill this valuable hybrid costs them in more ways than one. When the Irex starts running around killing their other assets for the pure sport of it. So it's Simon Masrani to the rescue with the only experienced pilot MIA. It's up to a novice to fly off into what is basically a war zone to bring down the beast himself, surrounded by yes men who wouldn't dare advise him otherwise. Don't do that. You'd be dead before you even realized you had an accident. 
But then again, I'm not sure if anyone here has adequate experience. Even his gunner doesn't lead his target, so they end up chasing the beast straight into the aviary. Simon perhaps not expecting these guys to be capable of taking out a chopper, learning too late that their ruthlessness should never be underestimated. It's a wonder Vic can't see the potential military applications of these flying dinos, because despite having hollow bones, they all seem to be tough as hell. And so with everyone in Jurassic World put in immediate danger, management is finally forced to call a containment breach. Once the dinos are already upon them, just a bit late. Meanwhile, the Indominus with a full stomach but still looking for life forms to kill indiscriminately, naturally turns her attention to the next available heat source, the masses of people waiting near the docks. Well, I guess these military applications are somewhat paying off. If declaring war on the people that pay your wages was the application you're going for, with Masrani gone and Claire running around in heels gunning dinos, a leadership vacuum allows InGen's dumbest current employee to take the reins, invoking another internal policy that delivers InGen all the power and oversight. The board assigned emergency ops to InGen's private security division. This guy Hoskins is in charge. Vic, as psycho as the Indominus, seems delighted that things are going terribly for his own forces. He's an agent of chaos with a badge and a mandate, taking this as a prime opportunity to field test the raptors. I'm sure that won't bite him. In the hand. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if Vic was hoping this thing would create an incident from the start, intending to test both the Irex's abilities and the raptors at the same time. How these comparatively tiny dinosaurs could ever bring down this behemoth, I couldn't say. They struggle to catch a a small pig and they've never even been out of containment. The best case scenario here is that they just run off into the woods. Vix also brought in a group of InGen thugs equipped with small caliber firearms. What are those meant to do? Stupidly, he was willing to run this fiasco without the assistance of Owen, despite no one else having any control over the raptors. Thankfully, nice guy Owen saves lives by reluctantly going along with it. Not that it would have affected Vic, he's cowering in the control room. But naturally, the Irex being part raptor can easily speak their language. Vic being one of only two people who could have predicted this. He then orders his men to start popping off before Owen can address the Irex's leadership challenge. And so, with the little raptor sortie ending in abysmal failure and with only conventional options left, the person ultimately responsible for park security decides to ship off, abandoning everyone. Though thankfully he won't get far, finally getting a reality check on the viability of these things as military assets. Easy boy. Possibly an act of retribution after Vic misgendered Blue. Clever girl. Ultimately, Vic knew almost nothing about these creatures despite obsessing over their potential military capabilities, leaving our good guys to employ the only option left to deal with the Irex, unleashing old reliable Rexy and initiating a monster battle royale. The Mosasaurus dominating the Indominus, finishing her off by dragging her down into the depths. And so, Masrani and InGen foolishness brings the company to the worst financial crisis in its history, forced to pay damages alone in excess of 800 million. But unlike InGen, Masrani was smart enough to diversify, so I'm sure they'll be fine. The InGen employees should just be thankful their opponents were running around constantly saving their asses. If it weren't for that, the fatalities would have been much higher. And congrats on receiving the dubious honor of being the first villains we've encountered who are consistently defeated by animals. In fact, over the course of the movie series, not a single InGen employee manages to put down a hostile dinosaur. Unless we count this guy blindsiding a puny dimorphodon. He was probably a contractor anyway. And that's nothing compared to Ian's terrified teenage daughter who managed to bag herself a raptor. InGen's performance in Jurassic World made even more embarrassing after a bunch of kids survive alone on the island in the following six months without a single fatality. But there is one persistent InGen villain who, as usual, survives against all odds. When Wu evacuated, which is something he does every time the consequences of his actions start to hurt. That's what being tomorrow today is. He left behind his most important research on a laptop. Apparently a dangerous night mission back to the rewilded island with a tiny crew was safer than just grabbing it before he left. Everything must be accounted for.
After the events of Jurassic World, Henry is found guilty of bioethical misconduct and stripped of all his credentials. Now he's just Mr. Wu. <laughs> Within Jen's nefarious leadership smashed to bits, the fate of both divisions left unknown. I'm sure they'll be back in the next trilogy or reboot. No, no, that's a common mistake. But a little thing like credentials won't stop Wu from continuing to chase the spotlight in Fallen Kingdom. Now resigned to doing unethical work for the criminal underworld. Finally whipping up the mini Irex Indoraptor with some more usable military applications. Well credit for going that low I guess. He sent you his thanks before making a hasty departure. And in this movie, there's one final kick in the guts for InGen, as we discover there was an active volcano on Isla Nublar all along, meaning both Jurassic Park and World were always doomed. Did no one think to do a geological survey before building this obscenely expensive shit? Ultimately, InGen's legacy is one of massive ecological upheaval, transforming the entire Earth. Unforeseen consequences occur. Leaving mankind well and truly punished for their hubris. One wonders how your race has survived, having so much fun. And yes, the Mosasaurus escaped to finish off what little remains of global fish stocks. But the journey down the plug hole is not quite over yet, because there is a spiritual successor to InGen in the form of Biosyn, another company so profoundly reckless they are ripe for a slain in a future episode.